Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. I just returned from the RFIC and IMS Microwave Week, which was held in San Diego this year. And I met a lot of the viewers there, and I get the chance to have a one-on-one -on -one with so many of you. And it was a fantastic time. Now, aside from all the technical presentations and workshops that are held at RFIC and IMS each year, there's also an absolutely enormous industry trade show where the latest and greatest millimeter wave microwave and terahertz instrumentation and equipment and connectors and cables are all on the trade show floor. It's huge. There are hundreds and hundreds of booths and it's impossible to see all of them in one go. And I, I try to record some of the cool things that I see there. So this episode is dedicated to some of the latest and greatest there, divided by manufacturers and vendor. And I hope you enjoy it. Next year, IMS will be in Washington. So I hope to see you there again in person. So here at one of the Roden Shores boots here, we have the SMW200A, which is an exceptionally linear vector signal generator. It's actually one of the only ones that goes up to 30 dBm Apple power directly from the box. But depending on the dynamic range you're looking for, you may want to get even more power. And Roden Shores has, of course, a set of power amplifiers of different sizes and different gains. But you're always trying to maximize that dynamic range EVM performance, depending on what you want to put power into. If you need 40 dBm of power, of course, you're not going to get that from this. You may have to use an external amplifier. And you have to choose that pretty carefully. Here we have 180 watt amplifiers, a massive amount of power up to six gigahertz. If I run this at 100 watt output power, I have an 80 watt back off. So I'm going to get a pretty good EVM performance of this one because I am running it at such a back off from its maximum output power. So the key of this setup over here with the multi-port performance tester is to show what happens at different PA power so you can pick the right solution. Of course, there's a VSA. BSC software platform from Proton Shores to make all the measurements, ACLR measurements, EVM measurements. But if you look at the portfolio of the parts from Roden Shores, you'll be able to find that they cover basically every power range at up to six gigahertz and even above. So definitely check it out. So here at the Roden Shores booth, we have their 110 to 170 gigahertz extenders that work directly with their own instruments. Roden Shores actually beat pretty much everybody else to market with these controllable remote heads. So when you connect one of these to any of their instruments, let's say on the transmitter on the SMW or on the FSW signal analyzer, the instrument knows about the frequency characteristic of these boxes. It knows what the gain is, it knows what the flatness is. And it calibrates the instruments to pick the correct LO and correct IF to be able to make this measurement. So essentially, you're creating a measurement plane reference at the edge of these devices, power and phase calibrated, which is extremely helpful at these frequency ranges as those calibrations are very difficult to do. These are controlled by Ethernet ports. So here they are transmitting an IF with an LO into the up converter, 110 to 170. I think this setup is running at around 144 gigahertz. And then there's an error on attenuator here in the middle. And then on the receive side, that gets directly demodulated with very good EVM performance, of course. These devices have very high bandwidth. So if you can pump in a lot of data through it, you will be able to demodulate that, which is one of the advantages of being between 110 to 170 gigahertz. Roden Shores has historically been very good at bringing their extenders to seamlessly work with their instrumentation. They've done that before with their oscilloscopes on the digitization side. And here they have the FSW with the record 8 gigahertz digitization bandwidth built into it. So a really sophisticated setup, making D-band measurements easy. So here we have also another 110 to 170 gigahertz characterization platform. This is built on top of the Roden Shores ZNA, one of the, I would say one of the best network analyzers currently on the market with a dual display and some very unusual architectures inside to allow the extended dynamic range that the ZNA provides. But because the ZNA has multiple sources inside of it, you could take multiple of those and put it directly onto the 110 to 170 gigahertz heads, and that gives you a two-tone output. A two-tone output at this frequency means you can measure YP3, you can measure IM3, and you can also measure frequency conversion, which is really, really hard to do on between 110 to 170. So you get a calibrated reference plane again, just like the FE 170 extenders there. And that gives you this characterization quite easily. All these remote heads work really nicely with the firmers inside of the Roden Shores instrument. So they want to remove the complexity from the user side and just allow you to do your measurements at two-tone in the same level you're used to doing it at lower frequencies. So definitely check out the 110 to 170 extenders, especially the ZNA itself on its own is a fantastic network analyzer. So here we're going to look at how we can measure phase noise above 110 gigahertz in D-band. As you can imagine, that's quite difficult to do, but it's particularly difficult to do if you want to add cross-correlation even on top of that. Now, cross-correlation for measuring phase noise at D-band is pretty important, especially if you want to characterize things like multipliers, so you can really eliminate the source phase noise and so on. So we have a synthesizer over here going into a multiplier also from Roden Shores. Now, this is the device that's being tested. The output of that goes into 
two mixers at the same time. And you do this because you want to perform cross-correlation on the two down conversions independently. And the reason all of that works together is because, of course, of the great FSWP phase noise analyzer. I would say probably the best phase noise analyzer on the market today with cross-correlation. And the two mixer down conversions directly goes in there. And the DSP inside the FSW will perform the cross-correlation and knowing where those signals are coming from at the appropriate frequencies. And on the display, you can see the phase noise measurement being continuously running in the background, and then the gray region at the bottom is the cross-correlation that constantly works and cancels out. And also, I want to point out to see how fast this is. Cross-correlation does take a long time to do if you're not performing measurements quickly, and FSW is probably one of the fastest platforms on the market to do this. It's really nice to see that you can actually measure phase noise cross-correlations up to 170 gigahertz. As far as I know, this is quite rare and a very difficult thing to do. But all of the Roden Shores components work seamlessly together. That's one of the strengths of their firmware development team. They kind of make everything work nicely together. So here we're going to solve a fundamental problem in wireless measurement. That is, how do you measure a system at lower frequencies in particular and get to a far field measurement in a compact form factor? So here we have a device under test. Here is just a horn antenna. And at the top, we have this ultra precise mirror. And the reflection or the wave waveforms coming from the horn antenna hitting that mirror are going to translate to a far field radiation pattern. So this conversion is done both in software and in hardware. And it's a very difficult problem to solve because of the precision required of the mirror at the top there. And over here in this area, we have switchable receivers of different bands that can switch in and out automatically. This entire system is fully motorized to be able to make this measurement seamlessly with the software, of course, that, that the Roden Shores provides. Now, in this chamber, there's also temperature control. So you can imagine that if you want to measure something across temperature, across frequency, in a compact form factor with complete isolation in this antenna chamber, how hard that is normally. And this system is not cheap, but it will perform that task. And here we go, you can see that you can switch the different heads there to measure at different frequencies. And this is all controlled by the software. So you can basically run a multiple sweep across all the different bands without having to interact with the system, without having to open the system. And once you close it, it's of course fully shielded. And you can imagine that for a temperature measurement, how important that is. And here's a look on the mirror from the bottom. It's a little bit hard to see from here. But yeah, that's a, that's a really beautiful piece of engineering. And one of the reasons why this far field translation can be done accurately at these frequencies. So here we're at the Keysight booth, and this particular demo is close to my heart because it's using one of the Nokia Bell Labs power amplifiers at D-Band to demonstrate some of the capabilities of the PNAX. So here we have the D-Band power amplifier from Bell Labs, and we have some VDI heads that operate at D-Band. And here's the challenge. The challenge is I want to perform EVM measurements on that power amplifier on a really broad bandwidth, and I want to perform DPD on it. And you can imagine how difficult that would be under normal circumstances because you have to deal with signal generation, you have to figure out with the training of the DPD, and then you also have to figure out how to analyze that signal to extract the EVM performance after you've done the DPD, before and after. So at the top, over there, we have our arbitrary waveform generator. That's going to generate an IF signal that's upconverted through the VDI head. That goes through RPA. And then on the other side, we receive that. But here's a trick. The IF of this is not digitized at the, entire, at the full bandwidth at the same time. That goes in the PNAX itself, which in an unusual way is able to split that into subsections, perform measurements on each one, stitch it back together through phase consistency and amplitude consistency of the instrument, stitch it together, and then get the complete EVM measurement of that. This is a fairly unusual and very complex system but you can immediately appreciate the benefit because the PNAX does not need to digitize this fully. Remember, that's a network analyzer, so they're doing something really unique here. As far as I know, this is the only people in the world who are doing these kind of measurements, and we're getting EVMs down to 0.75% from a power amplifier at this frequency, which is just unheard of. So it's a very interesting and unusual setup, allowing you to characterize things that would normally be impossible. So here at another Keysight booth, we have their latest and greatest in signal generation capability, all the way up to 110 gigahertz. So here we have the Keysight VXG, 52, 53 gigahertz system, ultra low phase noise, two gigahertz of modulation bandwidth. That takes you, it's one of the best arbitrary waveform generators, vector generators on the market. Two and a half gigahertz, I'm being corrected here by Sam. Uh, here we have the V3050. So the V3050 has been on the market for a little bit. This is basically a frequency extended down converter. But what it does have is pre-selection filters. 
And if you've ever met perform measurements in millimeter wave with a mixer that doesn't have a pre-selector, you'd know immediately why those images are so difficult to get rid of. You have to do it either in software, which takes a long time, or you have to build a pre-selector, and that's exactly what is going on here. And they've taken this technology, extended on the transmitter side. So now you can take the V3080A, directly connect it to the VXG, and the VXG recognizes this, figures out the IF and LO frequencies automatically, figures out the calibration coefficients automatically, and this itself also has pre-selection filter, which means that when you transmit, you know that this is not going to put out power outside of the frequency range you're interested in, and it's going to be selected. This is a very powerful combination for being able to generate complex vector modulations all the way up to 110 gigahertz. And this thing will give you EVMs with 100 megahertz modulation down to the minus 40, minus 42 dBA uh, SNR, and at, four, at 2 gigahertz, about minus 32 dBA SNR, which is really quite clean. And that's the chain from here into here, all fully analyzed using a UXA at the bottom and a VXG at the top. So this is basically now the set-of-the-art platform for generating vector signals all the way up to 110 gigahertz. So in the em emerging ORAN system, one of the very difficult things to do is how do you create the appropriate abstraction layers to allow these massive MIMO 5G systems to be tested effectively without having to actually tap into any, any cloud services. So here on the right side, we have an FR2 system, and the connection for that is connected to this box over here, and this box will act as the front hall analyzer. So all the signals coming from the FR2 radio in there is analyzed with synchronization inside of this box. And you, as a user, you basically have to only program and worry about what is happening in this box. On the frequency generation side, you have the signal going in, and there's a millimeter wave head over there that allows you to generate the RF waveforms directly in there and analyze them at the same time. So it's a pretty complex setup. But the key takeaway here is that if you want to make ORAN products possible, you have to have a platform to be able to test these at scale up to hundreds of gigabit per second without having to worry about some of the underlying complexity the synchronization, the waveform generation, how do you coordinate the RF with the different waveforms at different frequencies, and all of that has to happen under a consistent, cohesive software platform, which is exactly what they are doing with this different instrumentation. Now, with massive MIMO coming in at 5G and ultimately at 6G, this is only going to get more and more complex as the amount of data we want to send out is more, and the amount of synchronization we need to do with the radio heads is even going to be more complicated. And without these kind of abstraction tools, you're, you're essentially going to spend most of your time figuring out how to connect these rather than how to measure the performance of the link. And definitely check out the 5G massive MIMO OTA measurement setup. So here at the non-terrestrial test setup here, we have a couple of interesting challenges we need to deal with. Now, using Satellites for communication, especially for LTE or other forms of wireless communication is, has gained a lot of interest recently for obvious reasons because you can reach basically anybody anywhere in the world. But it comes with a huge set of challenges. Now take low orbit satellites. Because they're so close to Earth and because they move so fast relative to a user on the surface of the planet, you're going to have a lot of time delay as well as Doppler shifts which show up a lot more than they would for normal use cases that are not part of the current standards. So in the future standards, they are trying to apply that information directly from the data that's coming to the handset. So the handset is supposed to predict where the satellite is so it can compensate for those delays and those shifts. Otherwise, the waveform frequency shift would be too much and it's going to cause a lot of packet drops as well as loss of signal. So you have to test all this, in, of course, in some lab measurements in order to make sure this works. And that's the point of this test base station setup here is. So at the top over here, we have an emulation platform which you can introduce errors on purpose and figure out what happens to the actual frequency error in a real world system based on those errors that are appearing. There's a lot of software that happens in the background, but the key also to keep in mind is that Keysight constantly keeps up with the standardization. So on the release 16, 17, 18 in the future, they have to bring all that in. Now keep in mind that aside from creating hardware, it's really important for companies like Keysight to be up to date with this standardization. Without this standardization, you're not able to really put the appropriate pressure on the signals and appropriate packet management to make sure this actually works. So Keysight is part of the standardization as well as incorporating it into the instrumentation to make sure. Now as cellular and terrestrial networks become more and more important, it becomes more crucial to have these systems work seamlessly so that the designers can actually focus on creating the product and the software rather than have to deal with some of the physical limitations of these new devices. So here we are on Anritsu's booth, and I want to show you some of their latest offerings in network analysis. So here we're looking at a hybrid system, where on one side we have a VDI head that's from 110 to 170 gigahertz. And on the other side, we have this remarkably broadband 70 kilohertz to 220 gigahertz network analyzer head. 
Now, Enristio pioneered these nonlinear transmission line architectures for generating these high frequency combs quite a long time ago, and they've been building these very compact network analyzer heads that you can put on a probe for some time, and now they have extended that frequency up to 220 gigahertz. Now, I have to emphasize how hard this is in reality, because the connector that's coming out of this has to be at 0.6 millimeter. This is a still a coaxial connection. It's not a waveguide because it needs to go down all the way to 70 gigahertz, uh, to 270 kilohertz. And at the same time, they create these shims which convert the 0.6 millimeter coaxial connection to a waveguide on the other side, which is just absolutely crazy. And that allows it to interface with the waveguide of the VDI over here. So in this setup, you're able to generate a lot of power from the VDI and have a very broadband receiver on the other side and characterize 110 to 170 gigahertz quite seemingly. As far as I know, this system is unique in the world in, in its frequency coverage and also in its connector design. And this has to be basically designed from the scratch to be able to create even a 0.6 millimeter connector that would be have a, a pin to go down to DC. So in this situation, it's also nice for Unreal to show that if you do have these VDI heads, and if you do have other kinds of network analyzer front end, that you could combine them with their own designs in the same system and connect them, of course, to their network analyzer. This is probably the lowest cost system uh, that you could get from 70 kilohertz to 220, and it's definitely the most compact one to be able to make these measurements. So definitely check out their nice work on the nonlinear transmission lines, but also in the mix, match, and frequency ranges that they offer in this system. So here at Enrichtubut, let me introduce you to a, a new technique and a new product series they have here. These are distributed VNAs. And normally in a network analyzer, the reason you have the multiple ports of the network analyzer in the same box is because you need coherence up and down conversion in the same box. That's how a network analyzer works. You need the same LO frequency for the up conversion and down conversion to generate all the parameters for measuring S parameters. But that immediately becomes a challenge if the two points of the network analysis you want to do are very far apart, which happens in automotive applications, in distributed radars, distributed antennas, as well as things like submarine measurements. So if you want to separate these two points by hundreds of meters, you clearly cannot do this over cables anymore. Cables are lossy, they're not phase stable. If you have a cable that's 50 meters long, you're never going to be able to make accurate phase measurements in a network analyzer setup. So what they've done is that they've decoupled that by using fiber. So by placing their LO signals and the synchronization over the fiber allows them to go now up to 100 meters and separate these heads and up to 43 and a half gigahertz, which is quite a challenge of how do you do this kind of synchronization. So you have a head all the way in the back that performs that function of generating the signals necessary for the coordination between these two heads. The software takes care of the rest. You can put these things 100 meters apart, perform S parameter measurements up to 43 and a half, and everything works seamlessly. This certainly will enable some difficult measurements to be done, but next time that you sit behind another analyzer and you see the ports close together, and you, you wish you had something like this, you know exactly where to look. Let me also show you something, some subtle detail here, clearly designed by people who've been in the lab and know what the challenges are. Because these fiber connections are sensitive and fragile, you don't want to disconnect them. There's a locking mechanism with the cable over here, so you can even dangle this without having to pull on these cables. These are the kind of subtle details and attentions that I'm expecting from Anritsu. So here I'm at Tabor booth, and I've actually done reviews of their products before. If you remember on the channel, a, there is a four channel 12 gigahertz synthesizer that's phase and frequency coherently locked together. Now they've moved up to 40 gigahertz, so there's multiple versions of this, and they really like to make these modular designs. The nice thing about miniaturizing a synthesizer to this size is that you can port it to any form factor later on once you get it down to this size. So you can have one with a display connected to it, you can put four of them next to each other, lock them, get a coherent source, quad channel up to 40 gigahertz, and this has a standard output power plus 15 dBm down, down to minus 100 or so. And these are essentially your lowest cost solutions for getting the kind of performance up to 40 gigahertz. So we'll get one of these in the lab and we'll try it out. Here on the other side, we have a series of their modules in one box with an embedded controller already in there. There is a two channel IQ generator, two gigahertz, 16 bit resolution. There are upconverters IQ and there is uh, transmitters over there. So you can build from this a vector modulator with two gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth anywhere in the band in a small form factor, of course, lower cost than, than competition. Uh, this will be eventually released and then we will take a look at it as well. But I'm really quite excited to try the millimeter wave uh, uh, transmitter here and you should be able to do a bunch of experiments on it, measure phase noise, measure signal purity in such a form factor. I think there's a lot of nice use cases.
Here I'm at LPKF, one of the world leaders, of course, of doing this kind of uh, PCB manufacturing and prototyping. I don't need to introduce them, they probably know a lot about it, but this is the S104 machine, has 20 automatic tool changers. And one of the things LPKF does really well here is basically automate your entire PCB manufacturing and PCB prototyping pr process here. There's 20 automatic tool changers. This is a full four mil resolution machine, which is exceptional for a mechanical device. And once you submit your design, it's simply just gonna go through it. You've seen me use various CNC machines before. This is basically the state-of-the-art version of this. And with a 20 tool changer, you can submit pretty complex designs to this machine and have to just leave it and let it figure out all the other different tool changes. And then when, once it's done, you end up with a pretty complex structures directly on the PCB. There's also a laser version of this, which I think I've shown before on the channel, but we should take a look and see what it's doing now. And here's the Roy's Royce version of the laser etching here. So this is using a UV laser in order to perform essentially what the mechanical machine does, but using light. We've seen these kind of machines in the past. Now UV is a particularly good wavelength to use because it is most compatible with the widest range of materials. This is a one mil resolution machine with a 20 micron laser spot size. And all of that focusing is of course done automatically. So you're able to get those fine traces without having to figure out how to do this laser. These machines are state of the art, of course. Being able to etch a lot of different kinds of materials with the same laser and the same platform is pretty important. And it's one of the things that LPKF, of course, excels at. So here at Siglent, this is the SNA 5008. I've actually done a complete review and teardown of this four port network analyzer up to eight and a half gigahertz already. But the TDR measurement of this has now been evolved and improved. And we're gonna take a look at that on the channel too, as well. Here you can simulate eye diagrams, of course, through various device under test. And it's really nice to have a all-in-one instrument. That's one of the things Siglent's been doing really well, is that if you're going to spend the money and the effort of buying a four-channel network analyzer, you get the spectrum analyzer function as well as the eye mask TDR function built into it as options that you can add on top. We will definitely be taking a look at this now that the firmware has evolved. By the way, the frequency range of the network analyzers that Siglent makes now go up to 26 and a half gigahertz. This is a two-port system up to 26 and a half, but I am sure that a four-channel version of this will eventually come out as well, because once you build the hardware for 26 and a half gigahertz, you can extend that to four channels. So basically it means that the Siglent's ecosystem of RF analysis tools now basically goes up to 26 and a half gigahertz. So putting a lot of pressure on some of the bigger players on the market, providing perhaps a very good price performance ratio on these instruments. Now continuing under 26 and a half gigahertz analysis tools, here's the spectrum analyzer from Siglent with real-time capability as you can clearly see on the screen, 40 megahertz of analysis bandwidth and 26 and a half gigahertz of frequency coverage. And this extends quite nicely on top of the network analyzer we just saw. So you will soon be able to build basically a lab on the network analyzer, spectrum analyzer, and assuming synthesizers at some point, and vector generators up to 26 and a half, all within the Siglent ecosystem with a consistent software that works across all of their instruments. And here's something you may not be expecting. This is not available in the US yet, but this is Siglent's latest DSO. This is a 12-bit system, four gigahertz of bandwidth, 20 giga samples per second on four channels. One of the nice things I like is that if you do turn all the four channels on, you do get the uh, sample down to 10 giga samples per second, but you do preserve the four gigahertz front end bandwidth. And 10 giga sample, four gigahertz, with some appropriate filter shapes, you can still get a good usable signal out of that, which is very nice. Now, 12-bit is pretty impressive with four gigahertz of bandwidth, so hopefully when we get our hands on this, we will do proper SFDR and ENOP measurements, but if they can meet this performance, this is a, a fantastic scope and it puts it very competitively to the likes of Tektronix as well in this frequency range and of course the Roden Shores MXO4 series. So we'll definitely have to take a look at it. So here we are at Erevan booth, and here we have a WR10 frequency extender setup that they have connected to the Rodenshaw ZNA. Now these frequency extenders use a classic technique of having the LO and IF come from the network analyzer and do up and down conversion. This is common, that's what everybody does. And here we also have these waveguide interfaces, which I think I showed in one of the previous videos as well. These are mode, mode suppression interfaces, meaning that even though there may be a minor misalignment between them, you won't get a huge difference in the response through the waveguide. This is a unique technique that everyone has invented. Now here in the middle, we have a attenuator. This is a programmable attenuator that can be adjusted using this knob in the front. There's a display in here which tells you what the attenuation is. This is also motorized using an encoder in the back that can be controlled from the computer. They basically calibrate this in the factory, measure its response across 
the internal position of the encoder, and then they do a lookup table so that you can see what value you have. So that way you can, as you can see from the display, you have a very, very fine resolution in the attenuation, and you do have the motorized controls, which can be really quite fast. For, for some programmed measurements and repeated measurements, this would be very useful. But the entire system of everyone's venture into these complex RF devices like extenders and so on has been quite impressive in the past couple of years. They are becoming a strong contender in this space. And here we have another set of frequency extenders, again from Erevan, this time this is a D-band, and you can see that these do have a built-in attenuator as well, which is quite nice. Look at the form factor of this, it's really quite small and pretty nice for these kind of measurements. Here we also have a motorized microwave switch, uh, this in this case operating at D-band, and you can see that these heads are now being used this time with the Keysight PNAX, as opposed to the previous setup that was the Roden Shores ZNA, so this shows you that you really have cross-compatibility with any vendor, as you would always want from these network analyzer extenders up to that. I believe they also have free, high, even higher frequency than 110 to 170, basically covering everything in the near terahertz. And these automated switches for doing repeated measurements or TX, RX switching are quite helpful. So having these in the lab would be beneficial. And when it comes to components across pretty much any frequency range, there is short, no shortage from Erebon attenuators, amplifiers, connectors, antennas, couplers, bends, you name it. There is a lot, their catalog is quite extensive. And here's one of the latest offerings. This is a noise source, a D-band, with a very flat ENR. This is a problem that everybody pretty much has making noise figure measurements at these frequencies because the ENR flatness and the ENR repeatability is the number one criteria for getting a consistent noise figure. Any uncertainty in, in the ENR is uncertainty in the noise figure. So here we have a 110 to 170 system that's going to give you that flatness and be able to measure noise figure all the way up to 170 gigahertz. As I said, everyone is really expanding the ecosystem of components they have all the way to near terahertz. This is definitely something that we'll be looking at. And of course, you have to cover OTA measurements. Here we have a DAN converter all the way over there. That's for 110 to 170 gigahertz. This is now a single mixer, allowing you to measure OTA. This is a millibox antenna chamber. And on one side, we have a, a mechanically controlled device under test, and it's going across all the two-dimensional space the down converter receiver over there brings it down to IF, and you can process that information in order to get radiation patterns. And here on this side, we have the computer that of course performs those measurements. You can see 3D radiation patterns. So this is what happens when you have a lot of different components at the same time. You can start to build these really complex setups, including the OTA measurements at these very, very high frequencies using an ecosystem of components that you created, and everyone has been pushing aggressively in this space. So here I'm at the John Kosha booth. I've done, of course, a, a video on John Kosha cables on the phase and temperature stability. Here they have their latest Series A metrology grade cable connected to the PNA in the back. And at the end of this cable, we have a short standard. And this means that all the signal reflecting at the end of the cable and going back will experience a phase and amplitude that depends on the location of the cable. And what you want ideally is that no matter how you move this cable, you don't want any changes in the return loss of this. And that's quite difficult to do, but of course you're going to move this when you want to connect it under device under test. So I'm going to zoom in on that measurement, and that measurement is up to 50 gigahertz. And we're going to move the cable from one direction to the other. So if I move it all the way to the right side, you can see at the bottom we're getting about 1.9, 1.8 degree of phase. I mean, the amplitude change is almost insignificant. And if I put it back in the middle, again, it goes back to exactly where it was, which is very, very difficult to do. And this kind of phase stability is crucial. There's also a temperature stability with these cables, which is harder to show in this setup. But I did talk about that and show that in the video on the channel. And these are metrology grade for making these really precise measurements up to 50 gigahertz, connected to essentially any network analyzer. And here's another example of a setup to demonstrate the phase and amplitude stability of these cables. This time we're dealing with a much longer cable. And we have two motorized apparatus that move the cable in opposite direction. And this is a difficult test because you're essentially stressing the cable in two opposite directions at the same time. And we have a 50 gigahertz live S-parameter measurement here on the Keysight Field Fox. And you can see the deviations at the bottom there in terms of how the return loss as well as the S21 actually can change. So on a six feet cable up to, up to 50 gigahertz, it's very difficult to maintain this kind of stability. But having these live demos where people can see it under a realistic environment is the best test to really show that these things work. So here's another innovation from John Kosha's cables. When you're dealing with one millimeter or 0.8 millimeter cables, the main problem is that the tolerance of the screw 
and the tolerance of the center pin of the coaxial cable actually aren't the same. Which means that when you want to mate two cables together, you have to first make sure that the center pin of the male and the female are perfectly aligned before you screw it in. That's very difficult to do and is prone to error. And of course that error means that you will break the center pin and you will destroy the cable. So now here we have a two two-step locking system. So you can screw it in without having the center pins touch each other. And once you're satisfied that that connection is made, then you will tighten the second screw and that brings the two pins together and they make proper contact in the middle. This will increase the lifespan of these cables and these connectors significantly, especially if the person who's attaching them is not very experienced and doesn't know the tolerances of these things. And these go down to 0.8 millimeter, which makes it even harder. But simple changes like this and innovations in making connectors different is what makes the lifespan of these cables to be so much more, making them much more economical and more attractive solution. All right, here I'm at the VDI booth. I don't think VDI needs much of an introduction. I think that their frequency extenders all the way to essentially a terahertz is commonplace. You see it in pretty much everybody's booth. But here they're showing something particularly interesting. They have in the center a power combined module PA that they've designed. These are using Teledyne's indium phosphide HPT process, and they're getting up to 28 dBm of output power at D-band, which is an absolutely crazy amount of power. These amplifiers frequency range is about 115 to 145 gigahertz. And by connecting it to their frequency extender, of course having appropriate attenuators at the end, you can do a power sweep measurement and the PNAX has the capability of doing power cal as well as compression measurement. So here we see the compression curve, it looks quite nice and it's behaving very well. But uh, some, a module like this is very difficult to build in terms of, of course, in terms of the yield and cost as well. But getting 28 dBm of Apple power is pretty impressive. VDI has a rich set of ecosystem of frequency extenders and multipliers and so on, which pretty much everybody working in the near terahertz uses. So here I am at the form factor demo here, and Form Factor doesn't need much of an introduction. Their prop stations have been industry standard for a long time. This is a fairly complex setup where we are interested in performing DC to 220 gigahertz measurements in a single sweep. And this is useful for characterization of devices as well as really broadband components, for example, for coherent optic modulators and so on. This is the kind of setup you would need to do. And it's very difficult to get that entire frequency coverage in one go. So we have two different heads over here, one from Keysight covering up to 120 gigahertz, the other one from 140 to 220 gigahertz, and you have to stitch them together. There's a diplexer built into the probe at the end that combines these two, and the software on the PNAX takes care of the rest, allowing you to do a single sweep from essentially DC to 220 gigahertz, which is really impressive. All the mechanical to put this together itself is, is quite a challenge. But this is a Summit 200, 200 millimeter probe station, fully automatic or semi-automatic. It does have the micro chamber that's been introduced quite a few years ago, but these systems can go from minus 60 degrees to plus 300 degrees Celsius, and you can purge the environment of the micro chamber so they don't get condensation down those very low temperatures. This is a common technique used in order to be able to do minus 60 in essentially any environment. And you can see there's a window there that's EMI shielded, so there's a metallization on the surface of that glass, so you can completely shield that. You can also go completely dark, as some of the devices, especially very low noise VCOs and other PN junctions are sensitive to light coming in. You don't want photons interacting with your devices. You can shield out that, close that out. There's software that monitors the calibration of this continuously in some of the automated systems. There's a wafer loading system over there. So if the system notices that the calibration has drifted, it stops the measurement, loads the calibration, does all of that automatically and continuous testing, sort of fully, fully automated system with no operator involvement. These things are the, basically the industry. Uh, standards for being able to do make these measurements. We do have fully automated probe manipulators. All of this just works together with the software that Form Factor provides. These are fantastic probe stations, basically some of the best in the industry, and being able to do these single sweep measurements in complex setups is unique. So here I am at Hyperlabs. I was here a couple of years ago as well, and it's nice to see that they have really pushed their commitment to 110 gigahertz components, basically to a wide range of offerings. We have biases, we have signal dividers, we have attenuators, we have decoupling capacitors, we have a broadband coupler, we have biases. And all of these components are crucial in the next generation of, for example, coherent optic device testing. 
because you really want to make sure that these components do not introduce additional frequency uncertainty, phase uncertainty into your measurement so they are easy to embed and of course work all the way from DC to 110 gigahertz so that you can perform those measurements. As having done measurements up to 110 gigahertz regularly, especially for drivers that are broadband, having these components work very well is crucial. And it's just a matter of time before Hyperlapse takes this a step further. 0 0.8, 0 0.6 millimeter connectors taking these to even higher frequencies as the demand for 200 gigabaud coherence systems will continue. So definitely check out the, the part numbers of these and look at the website for the data sheet. There's a lot of numbers to go through, so I don't want to go through it right now, but all of these are well characterized up to 110 so you can see exactly how they behave. So here I'm at the Samtech booth for something fairly unique and interesting. So here we have flexible waveguides that look like coaxial cables. Now flexible waveguides have been made in the past, but the problem with them is that you have to create an ecosystem around them, particularly the connectors, so that people will be able to connect them into devices and into boards that they're familiar with. Here we have a transition from a flexible waveguide into, it could be a WR10, WR12, depending on what frequency range you're working at. Now these things are fairly difficult to make. They're about 80% made of air, but they do have a complex internal structure that allows the propagation uh, with the right mode through it. And this gives you a huge amount of flexibility, of course, because you can connect very high frequency waveguides from one point to the other without having to rely on a rigid waveguide. And if you use a regular coax, you're going to have to have more loss, of course. So this sits very nicely between the performance in terms of loss of a rigid system and a coaxial system. And these guys with having different connectors allows you to go onto a PCB in and out, connect it to different antennas. And here even we have a little demo on the right side that shows these waveguide pieces connected to some motorized servos that they can move around. And the nice thing here is that you can basically move your antenna, move your RF components freely around without having to worry about the interface at millimeter wave to whatever device you're testing. This is a unique feature and a unique set of components. And Samtech, of course, is a master of making connectors. They're one of the biggest in the world. So they're the right people to tackle these kind of challenges. Very nice. We're definitely going to buy some of these for our own use. So here I'm at Quinstar and making wide dynamic range measurements at frequencies between 75 to 110 or any other high frequencies is quite a bit of a challenge. And we do often need attenuators. Now most of waveguide attenuators are typically controlled manually. In this case we have a 70 dB dynamic range electromechanically controlled attenuator in the W band, which is quite a wide range of coverage actually. And here in the front you have a keypad which you can dial in any frequency, any attenuation you want across the frequency range of this. And you can control and program the steps that you're interested in using. And you're able to also connect this via several different interfaces, Ethernet, serial, USB-C, to whatever automation platform that you want. And because it's already essentially pre-calibrated with internal lookup tables or whatever it may be, you're able to dial in whatever you want and then have, don't have to worry about how the attenuation is set you just get the 0 to 70 dB of attenuation through these different interfaces. These automated systems at these frequencies are quite valuable and will reduce a lot of uncertainty at these high frequencies. So here I am at the MPI booth at IMS and I want to show you something really unique in terms of the probing system, combining multiple technologies into one platform to bring you uh, some extraordinary flexibility. So this is essentially a fully automated probe station with a wafer loader that can do 100, 150, 200 millimeter wafers. The ability to load wafers directly in an automated system is, of course, nothing new. They've been doing it for quite some time. But there's a few interesting additions here. The probe manipulators support differential 120 gigahertz attachments at the top or extenders that go up to essentially near terahertz. Now, when you want to do a temperature measurement, you're going to run into several challenges at the same time. It's very difficult to leave the probes landed on a substrate or on a wafer if you're changing the temperature of the measurement. So they have developed this unique platform here where the movement of the substrate and the movement of the chuck as a function of temperature it co is compensated by the movement of the probe. So you can actually leave your probes on your sample as you change the temperature, which is, which is very, very interesting. And it's something that saves so much time and especially saves the pads of the device you're testing across temperature. Because if you have to lift and land multiple times, then the uncertainty of the measurement for the measurement itself versus the temperature gets confused. So it's a really attractive solution. Then on top of that, they have a plate where they can purge the temperature difference gradient from the substrate to the top. So if you're very, very hot, you can protect your 
manipulators, you can protect your extenders from the high temperature. Or if you go below ambient, you can protect the whole thing from condensation and of course from frost if you go well below zero. But adding on top of that, something that I really, really like is that they have co-designed with MicroSange this thermal imager. Now MicroSange uses this very unique technique of hitting the sample with photons in a green wavelength, and the return photons from the sample have some correlations with the temperature of the material itself, and there is some synchronization, and there is some laser pulsing that happens to do all that. Now that camera is essentially in the visible range, so using the same lens and having two different cameras, you can now not only look at your wafer, you can look at your probe, you can look at your positionist and do automated landing, but you also get the temperature, gradient across the sample, but you're getting it at optical resolution. So now you can see gates and you can see device temperatures directly on there. And if you look at over here, that green light that you see, that's of course from the MicroSange system for the thermal, where you can see the substrate very well. Now to combine this thermal measurement, the automated setup, the temperature control, the temperature compensation, all of this in one platform, I don't have to tell you, this is a massive, massive cost saving if you need to perform all of these measurements at the same time. Always happy to see the MPI putting a lot of pressure in the industry with bringing these latest innovations to market so we can do these complex measurements. So here I am at the Tektronix booth. And you've certainly seen my Tektronix 6 series uh, uh, preview here on my channel, both the 8 channel and the 4 channel version. Now the DDS capabilities of the Tektronix and the absolutely brilliant software that Tech has written for this to allow you to follow things like phase amplitude and over time and so on and cross correlate all these channels means that you open up an entire new possibility to analyze signals that are unique. So in this case, they have the Tektronix AWG 7 series 70,000 series arbitrary waveform here. They're using the two channels. On one channel, we are getting a 5G NR waveform. On this channel, we have a radar waveform. And they're simultaneously being analyzed by the Tektronix 6 series. And you can demodulate, cross, time, correlate, as well as figure out how the joint communication and sensing platform could actually operate. One of the beautiful things about having complex software hardware marriage in an ecosystem like Tektronix is that you are not no longer thinking about these instruments as an oscilloscope or a waveform generator, but you're thinking about them as application enablers. You're now exploring how these applications interact, how the waveforms should look like, without having to worry about the clutter of the instrumentation. That's really the next, the next phase of instrumentation design in the next several years going forward. And of course, Tektronix thinks about that in their platform. So here I am at Pickering. Now Pickering is a world leader in automation and uh, consistent system testing. I, I don't need to introduce them beyond that, but they have a couple of new products here that I want to talk about. This incredible complexity that you see here is a 12 by 12 matrix switching up to 18 gigahertz. Their systems can actually be configured all the way up to 110 gigahertz. And one of the things Pickering does is that they essentially work with their customers who need automated testing at scale. And they're going to customize the solution exactly the way you want to. And they model every single component inside of that system. So if you buy one unit today with a certain characteristic and you ask for another one later on, they would take the information they have collected during the first assembly and build another one that is as identical to the original one as possible. This means that you can expand your automated set testing platform as the volume grows and you don't have to worry about having to adjust and readjust and figure out the differences between the test and measurement equipment. That's the last thing you would want to do. You want to make sure that you're really measuring your DUTs at scale during automated testing rather than this. So this complex structure is going up to 120 gigahertz is pretty impressive. You can mix and match PXI, PXIE, LXI, whatever platform you want, and create something custom, form factor, and performance exactly to your needs. Pickering has been doing this for a very, very long time. They continue to upgrade and make more complex systems as the needs of the industry grows in MIMO, in higher frequency, especially going into near terahertz, millimeter wave, 5G, and so on. And this kind of automated testing is the backbone of productization. So here's another product that Pickering has just released. These are now MEM-based, MEMS-based multiplexers, which is quite different from electromechanical switches, of course, and very different from solid state switching. Now in an electromechanical switch, you have the advantage of high repeatability, very high power handling, but they're often slow and they're bulky. And the frequency will always be limited to some extent. If you go to solid state testing and switches, they're very fast, but of course you have linearity problems and their behavior across different power levels will be different. A MEM switch is the best of both worlds. They're 50 microsecond switching speed. MEMS have been used 
in, in the industry for a very, very long time. But Menlo Micro essentially is trying to bring MEMS technology into a large scale platform, allowing these complex things to be built. So this is an, a quick example of that. These are one to four multiplexers operating up to four gigahertz, and I believe they, they work even up to five gigahertz. Three billion switching times in a really tiny form factor, 50 microseconds switching, to enable these automated fast hopping signals that you may want to catch, and repeatability, of course, that comes as good with MEMS. It's nice to see technology from multiple platforms come together under the same roof, enabling next generation automated testing. So another way that Pickering helps the customers get to their productization quickly and to the test equipment they're looking for is that they have a tool now that allows you to customize a certain chassis with as many components as you want, LEDs, indicators, switches, and so on, and you can build and customize that directly on their website, figure out what you're looking for, and once you have that, then they can just simply build that. One of the, often the challenges of defining these kind of boxes is that the back and forth relationship that has to always be there to make sure that they're building what you're looking for and this kind of GUI based, uh, easy, easy to use web based applications allows for that. So what you were just looking at has been fully assembled and, and put together. So this is the kind of procedure that you would follow to be able to get these kind of systems built. This is essentially then the logical step for when these things become too complex because it allows you to make sure you build what you want without making any mistakes. So here I'm at Boontan's booth, and we actually have a new synthesizer that they have designed. The synthesizer is a fast frequency hopping architecture that allows you to jump between one frequency to another in about 350 microseconds. Now you have to appreciate that the underlying PLL architecture of this instrument has to support that frequency hopping, because not only do you need to hit the next frequency, but you also need to hit it, stabilize it, amplitude and phase, and also maintain good phase noise overall. Frequency hopping is actually not difficult to do if you were to sacrifice phase noise. But in this case, they are trying to maintain both of these at the same time. Frequency hopping has a lot of advantages, a lot of applications in communication, particularly cryptography and transmitting and capturing very wide frequency hops. It's a very, very useful instrument. You can also use this to measure the response time of other devices. Say you have a power amplifier that is dealing with TDD signals. If you hop from one frequency to another and you drive your power amplifier into saturation, you want to make sure that the power amplifier recovers quickly. In that case, you want your source to be much faster than the recovery of the power amplifier, so you're not limited by your source in that case. Now, here they're using their USB power sensors to measure that. These USB power sensors from Buntan are also state-of-the-art in terms of real-time capture. They can capture extremely shallow and narrow pulses, and here we have an instrument that connects to this. So this is basically a power meter that can be connected to any of their USB instruments and has a GUI interface in there. It has an Ethernet connection in the back, so you can operate it from anywhere in the world, allowing you to be able to measure these really narrow pulses uh, across the frequency. So imagine now if you have a device under test sitting between the synthesizer and the power meter, then what you will be measuring over here is the response of the DUT across that fast frequency hopping. These things go all the way up to 18 gigahertz, allowing the, you know, the new, new open bands, particularly potentially 6G bands between 7 to 20 gigahertz to be tested with this with fast frequency hopping. So let me show you another setup here that is quite unique. This device over here in the center is something that Wuntan has designed and made for demonstration purposes. It has a direct output and an amplified output. It means that when you connect the two outputs to two of these real-time power sensors, you can get a relative measurement on how these devices, the amplifier versus the reference, behave under different load conditions. Now, when you compress the amplifier, it's going to behave differently than the reference path. Two real-time sensors being simultaneously captured on the GUI over here tells you the difference between those two paths. Now, if you look over this on the side, you have the, you have the plot over here, which is a CCDF plot. The reference path and the path through the amplifier diverge from each other after a certain output power. This is a compression behavior on the amplifier. It's normal, but this measurement is really hard to make because you're measuring, making this measurement essentially in real time across power. Now you can have a certain crest factor through an amplifier and you may expect a particular behavior, but unless you can plot the CCDF as a function of the power across the entire dynamic range of the amplifier, you may never see this delta. And if you don't see this delta, you, you wouldn't know why your power amplifier is not behaving the way they were doing. So I really like to see how Buntan basically takes a platform they've created, in this case real time, power sensors like this, even create demos just to get people to appreciate how difficult these measurements are, combining it all together in one cohesive platform, and then you can, of course, characterize your own amplifiers under any circumstances. I want to em emphasize again that these kind of measurements used to be in the domain of oscilloscopes and real-time spectrum analyzers and power meters are much, much more cost effective, but they normally don't do these kind of measurements, so this is totally unique. Definitely check it out.
So here we also have Holzworth products. Now I've talked about Holzworth products in the past. They are essentially the king of phase noise and doing correlation measurements. I'll talk about it in a second. They do have a DDS-based multi-channel synthesizer over here. This particular one is configured as 40 gigahertz and 20 gigahertz. You can mix and match them because you have essentially independent channels inside of this box. And you can get up to 40 gigahertz signal coming out. Now these really compact synthesizers with very low phase noise obviously have a lot of different applications. But on the other side, this particular phase noise analyzer is something that d essentially directly competes with the Roden Schwartz FSW, but at a significantly reduced price. As with any cross-correlation phase noise measurement systems, there are multiple down converters in here that then measure at baseband the correlation factors and subtract that from the original phase noise. With systems like this, as it is with the competitors, you, you can go down to minus 170, even minus 180 dBc per in some uh, significant, in, in some situations, depending on the signal coming in. And these cross correlations can be used to find out residual phase noise and of amplifiers. You do have access to the LO input and output on this instrument, which is critical. You can reconfigure it and adjust it depending on what you want to measure. It's a pretty flexible platform that I think I've talked about in the past too. Here we are looking at measurements of cross correlation phase noise from 10 hertz to 100 megahertz offset. 10 correlations, about 10 seconds, which is pretty fast. Going down to 10 hertz for correlation takes a very long time. Going to 1 hertz will take even longer. But it allows you to measure those even close to essentially the ultimate drift of oscillators. You can capture that. The boundary between cross-correlation measurements and Allen variance in something like a, a crystal oscillator stability is a very difficult thing to close. And 1 hertz gets you pretty close to that in terms of uh, being that you can use, of course, a rubidium standard if you want to make absolute uh, frequency reference measurements.